Good morning, everybody. The title of my talk this morning is called A Strange King. What does Palm Sunday tell us about Jesus? And it comes uh, from John chapter 12. For those of you who are not maybe familiar with the Christian faith, Easter is the epicenter of Christianity. Uh, on Good Friday, uh, we remember that Jesus died for the sins of the world. On Easter Sunday, we celebrate that three days later he rose from the dead and that changes everything forever. And on Palm Sunday, this Sunday, the Sunday before Easter Sunday, we remember Jesus setting his face towards Jerusalem, uh, resolutely and determinedly going to die for the sins of the world. And we remember with awe his love and his courage. But uh, Palm Sunday tells us some interesting things about Jesus and it speaks particularly to a society and culture which is questioning whether religion is a good thing. And uh, it's interesting that the Jesus that Palm Sunday reveals behaves in a very different way to the way that most religious institutions have behaved during history and in fact most religious people behave today. So uh, look with me at John chapter 12 to see this strange king, to tell us what Palm Sunday uh, teaches us about who this Jesus is. And uh, 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 the best way I know of describing that atmosphere on uh, that first Palm Sunday is to uh, think of a film where crowds are kind of welcoming a president or a prime minister or a monarch but the security around them is paranoid because they know that there's an assassination attempt so think you know vantage point to that film or, or the day of the jackal uh, because that's the kind of atmosphere because you see just a few days earlier in bethany a place three and a half miles outside of jerusalem three and a half kilometers and um, Jesus had raised a man called Lazarus from the dead. The whole village had been at his funeral. Uh, they'd seen him incarcerated in a tomb. And three days later, Lazarus is walking around. Jesus has raised him from the dead. And uh, there is this incredible uproar because the logic went, uh, Jesus has raised Lazarus from the dead that means Jesus is the Messiah, the ones the Jews have waited for. This is a very big day. And so there's huge excitement and there's an energy and a momentum to the crowd which the religious leaders cannot control. And, uh, and in verse 11 of John chapter 12, it just tells us that the chief priests were now looking for an opportunity to assassinate Jesus. So with that backdrop, Jesus is starting to make his way to Jer towards Jerusalem. The news has already traveled ahead of him. There are crowds welcoming him because he, they are so excited because the Messiah has come. Now, uh, in, in verse 12, it tells us that it's Passover. That just adds a whole nother uh, amount of fuel to the fire. Because you see, Passover was one of the three big festivals that Jews were expected to travel as pilgrims to, to Jerusalem for. Uh, historians say that the, the normal population of Jerusalem was about 40,000, and at Passover it got to 200,000. And Passover was a celebration of what happened in the Old Testament when the Jews who had been slaves in Egypt got rescued and the Egyptian army was defeated. Now, you must remember that Israel at this time of this first Passover that we're reading, this Passover that we're reading about here, uh, was under Roman occupation and rule. They were being brutally oppressed by the, room, the Romans. And so it, it doesn't, doesn't take a huge brain to realize that there is a, there's two and two being put together and making five because Jesus has raised Lazarus from the dead. That must mean Jesus is the Messiah. And hey, this is Passover when we celebrate how God destroyed our oppressors, Egypt. And now the Messiah here is here to destroy our oppressors, the Romans. And so there is this toxic, uh, kind of build up of anger and energy and excitement because they believe 
that Jesus is a Messiah who is now going to lead a rebellion which once and for all gets rid of the Romans in Israel. And the other thing that's really important to know in this story is that this, as the same time as Jesus is entering into the west gate of Jerusalem via Bethany, coming up from his palace in Caesarea Philippi into the east gate of Jerusalem is Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor himself. And he's not there to uh, join in the Jewish festival. He's there because he knows that Israel is a nightmare to rule at the best of times. One historian says that there's no, no sooner had the Romans put down um, an uprising in one place, it sprung up in another. Uh, 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 Pontius Pilate is coming to Jerusalem because 200,000 Jews remembering how one superpower was destroyed in their history and looking forward to the next is something that needs really hard control. And the fascinating thing is that Pontius Pilate would have traveled into Jerusalem with probably 600 war horses and as many soldiers as it took to basically say to Jerusalem, don't you dare. Don't you even think about it. It was an intimidating demonstration of power to suppress a um, occupied population. That's the context for um, this incredible story of, of, of the Passover. And so uh, we read in verse 13 that um, as Jesus walked towards Jerusalem, the crowd get hold of these palm branches. Now, on, on the one hand, you know, date palms grow all over the Middle East. What's, uh, what's the big deal about that? But again, it's so full of symbolism in history because in 141 BC, Simon the Maccabee, who was a Jewish leader, had driven the Syrians out of Jerusalem and conquered them and set Jerusalem free. And as he came back into Jerusalem, he was greeted by a crowd waving palm leaves. And ever since then, palm leaves have become a symbol of Jewish nationalism. It was on the Jewish coins, and it was also on the Roman coins printed for uh, and made for, for Israel. It was a clear celebration of Jewish identity. And so uh, they might as well have been waving a national flag as Jesus came into Jerusalem on that first Passover. It was a clearly deeply nationalistic, deeply patriotic uh, welcome because they believed that Jesus was this Messiah, the one that the Old Testament had looked forward to, who was going to set the people of Israel free. They might have, uh, they, you know, it, it's just uh, incredibly patriotic. And they're, they're shouting, it tells us in verse 13, from Psalm, eight, Psalm 118, Hosanna, which was a, a Hebrew phrase for simply saying, save us now. And uh, as you look at John um, 12, verse 13, you can see that they were saying, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the king of Israel. That's not ambiguous. If you're an Englishman, they might as well have been singing Land of Hope and Glory. This, this was welcoming the revolution. It's uh, incredibly uh, energized with, with pending violence and aggression. That's what's happening that first Passover. Now, at this point, it, you could read the story and it would seem that Jesus be, is just being swept along with the crowd and uh, almost you know, losing control of the moment. He's not come to be a military ruler. He's not come to be a conquering king in a worldly sense. Uh, and, um, and what Jesus does now shows that actually he was absolutely in full control of everything that was happening. Because John doesn't go into the details, Mark's gospel does, about how Jesus has thought ahead about how he was going to enter into Jerusalem. And so he made all the arrangements and Jesus uh, totally inverts this energy for violence, this vitriol, this aggression, by riding into Jerusalem on a young donkey. He'd thought it all through. You see, in the Old Testament, um, 
um, because there was this worry that kings would always be oppressive, the first kings, David and Solomon, um, they had uh, they rode on a donkey to show their humility. Jesus is demonstrating, on the one hand, a real, true humility. On the other hand, he's conscious that Pontius Pilate has got 600 war horses. So he is becoming the complete antithesis of that, eh, that power and that aggression by riding in on a donkey. And it becomes all the more significant because in verse 15, uh, John's Gospel talks about a verse from Zechariah chapter 9. Zechariah is the second to last book of the Old Testament. And it predicted that the Messiah would come seated on a, a donkey. And uh, John just leaves it there. But actually, I, Zechariah chapter 9 is really much more significant than that and is the whole backdrop to that first Passover Sunday. Because Zechariah 9 talked about an end of war, a proclamation of peace to the nations. And listen to this. In verse 10 of Zechariah 9, it says, I will take away the war horses from Jerusalem and bring peace to the nations. As for you, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will free your prisoners. Can you see how Jesus is the complete fulfillment of everything that Zechariah was looking forward to? Away with the war horses. This king is a different kind of king. He comes on a donkey. He comes in humility. He comes in peace. And he comes to die. And his blood spilt will be the means of healing and peace for the entire world. It's an incredible allusion that John makes to Zechariah 9. And, and just assumes that the readers will do the background homework to see the full significance of it. Not the not that the disciples understood at all. <laughs> John makes really clear in verse 16, the disciples are absolutely clueless. They still think that the Jesus they've been following for three years is still going to be this Jewish military messiah. Those deeply ingrained cultural ideas, they don't go away quickly. And the story finishes in verse 19 with... Um, John putting on the lips of the Pharisees when they say the whole world has gone after him. It's part irony, but it's part prophecy as John retells the story of that first Palm Sunday. It's an incredible story, an astonishing story. A strange king. What does Palm Sunday tell us about Jesus? Well, there are a number of things it points to which I don't have time to explain this morning in detail, but let me just say a couple of them to you. First of all, here is the king of life who has come to die. He just raised Lazarus to life, but he's coming to die. He's an all-powerful king who refuses the power of the crowd. If he's got the power over life and death, he can do anything. But he refuses. He's got a different agenda. An all-powerful king who refuses power. A heavenly king who comes with earthly humility. Jesus makes it very clear in the way he's come to Jerusalem. He's not come to conquer, but he's come to serve. But I just want to talk about two others briefly. The fourth one is this. He's a peaceful king who causes division. Have a think about this. Jesus is a peaceful king who causes division. Jesus isn't doing anything here to stoke the flames of revolt. In fact, he's doing the precise opposite. He is, he is doing everything he can to calm the situation, to be the complete antithesis of the war horses coming in from the other side of, of Jerusalem. He comes in peace. He comes in humility. He comes to serve. And yet... People are out to kill him. He's this Marmite figure that people either love or hate. What's going on? Well, it's this, you see. Jesus came to make peace possible for everyone forever. He was not there to bring peace to Israel by overthrowing Roman rule. Jesus knew his role was not to try and keep some kind of unstable temporary peace for some people, but to make eternal peace for all. Peace between all of us and God. Peace between all of us and each other, and even peace within our own lives. And for Jesus, 
that meant he had to confront the normal Roman way of making peace, which was destroying your enemies. He had to confront the alternative forms of peacekeeping, which were always based on power and authority, whereas Jesus' peacemaking was going to be based on love, his sacrificial giving of himself for, for the sake of the world. Just to say this to followers of Jesus this morning, if we are going to follow the Jesus of Palm Sunday, just make sure that your goal is making peace, not merely keeping the peace. What's the difference? Well, peacemakers value truth. Peacekeepers are so afraid of confrontation that they avoid the truth and offer false and temporary kinds of peace. Let me read to you from a, a Christian writer called Brandon Cox. He says, I've struggled with this for most of my life. I don't like conflict or confrontation at all. I assume all conflict is bad and unfruitful, so I often avoid sharing truth that might be painful or harmful to a relationship. And that's no way to experience actual peace. It just leads us to hold on to hurts and pain that fester inside and come boiling out when they can no longer be contained. But Jesus said in Matthew 5, blessed are the peacemakers. That's the way he lived. The pathway to joy-filled living is doing the hard thing of sharing both truth and grace in a restorative way. It's speaking up without being condescending or argumentative. It's taking a stand, but a stand alongside people rather than over them. Just make sure your goal is to make peace and not merely to keep the peace. Otherwise, we're not really following Jesus. They're really challenging words and they come directly and are inspired by Jesus' example of being the peacemaker who yet caused division uh, in that first Palm Sunday. And the last point is this, Jesus is a king who brings hope by disappointing people about what they think they want. Jesus is a king who brings hope on that Palm Sunday by disappointing people about what they think they want. Jesus refuses to give the crowd what they want. He wants them to start, they want him to start an insurrection. But that is not the will of God that Jesus is there to fulfill. He has got a much bigger hope. And once again, we can return back to this remarkable passage in Zechariah 9 to see this being fulfilled in Palm Sunday. In Ze Zechariah 9, Zechariah says to the people of Israel in that generation and time, Return to your fortress, O prisoners, but your prisoners of hope. And even now I announce that I will restore twice as much to you. Can you see how Jesus on Palm Sunday was the fulfilment of that verse in Zechariah? He might as well, with his actions, been saying to the crowd, Look, you've got to go back to be prisoners in, to, in Jerusalem of your Roman oppressors. But you've got to understand you're prisoners of hope and I've come to give you hope because I'm going to die on a cross and I'm not just going to make peace between you and the Romans. I'm going to make it possible for us all to live at peace with God, which is the greatest need of humanity because all our sin separates us from God. And I'm going to die on a cross which will free everybody to be at peace with God. That will make it possible for every nation and tribe and people to be at peace with one another. And uh, when we're at peace with God and with peace with one another, you'll know a peace peace that passes all understanding in your own life. I've not come to give you what you want because I've got more than you can ask or ever ask or imagine in mind. I want to bless you more than your prayers even have the capacity to begin to understand. Jesus was a king who brings hope by disappointing people about what they want. It's a, it's a reminder to all of us uh, as Christians who pray for things that actually once we've prayed and left them with God, we then need to trust that he loves us 
and he knows what's best for us. So I said at the start that Palm Sunday spoke right into our questions about religion today because it reveals a Jesus who behaves very differently to religious institutions and most religious people. And Palm Sunday to finish just gives us a checklist of authentic Christian spirituality uh, uh, in, in contrast to you know, nominal Christian religion. And the checklist is this. How do religious institutions and religious people use power? There have been so many abuses of power, but Jesus is an example of one who consistently refused power. Don't trust religious institutions or religious people who misuse power because it's not authentic Christianity. Secondly, Jesus demonstrates a, a compelling humility of character. Don't trust religious institutions or religious people who don't demonstrate the same humility of character. Thirdly, the whole raison d'etre of Jesus in that Palm Sunday is to be a peacemaker, not a temporary peacekeeper. The way that you can tell authentic Christianity is to go into a church and see how they get on with each other. Are they making peace? Because whenever you get a group of people together, there are always issues. <laughs> uh, that's just the nature of life. Uh, as one writer put, where two or three are gathered in their name, in his name, sooner or later there'll be trouble. It's how they deal with that trouble. Are they, do they sweep it under the carpet or do they actually make peace with one another? Because Jesus himself said, we've got to learn to speak the truth in love. He said that uh, by this shall all men know that you're my disciples if you love one another. Authentic Christianity will always char be characterized by that loving peacemaking. And the last thing is this, that genuine Christianity will always faithfully point beyond what people think they need to be saying, actually, our deepest need is that we need a saviour. We need someone who will die for the sin that separates us from God both now and forever. And what other, whatever other needs humanity has, that is our deepest need. We need a saviour who will make peace with God and make peace with, with each other and within ourselves possible. That's the story of Palm Sunday from John's Gospel. This strange king and all the wonderful things it shows us about Jesus. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for the remarkable character of courage and love we see in you on that first Palm Sunday. Thank you that though your way of kingship might have seemed strange to people then, thank you that it was to be utterly transformative and to meet their deepest need. And on this Palm Sunday, Lord, I guess the deepest prayer I can pray, that we can pray, is that, Lord, may your strange kingship be seen in our strange way of living, that your kingdom would come and that your will would be done on earth as it is in heaven through your people. Amen.